welcome once again to Leader Talk, the CNN IBN special where we discuss leadership mantras of success with leaders from the world of sport and the corporate world. Today we are joined by two very special gentlemen on Leader Talk today. The Australian champion, World Cup winning champion and uh, great cricketer Steve Waugh. And also with me Rajan Bharti Mittal, Vice Chairman and MD of Bharti Enterprises. Appreciate both of you joining us on Leader Talk. Let me st start with you, Steve. For most Indians in particular, there are two words that are associated with Steve Waugh. One is grit and the other is courage. Is that something that you also identify yourself with? Do you see yourself in those terms as that gritty Australian fighter? I'm glad they're good words. That's, that's positive. Um, look, I think that's part of what I was on the cricket field. Um, courage is a nice word to be associated with. Grit, I think, is an underrated word. I think it means that you make the most of your potential and um, you always give 100%. And if people associate that with me, I'm happy because whatever I do, whatever project I'm involved in, uh, I make sure that I commit fully to it. Um, if I can't do that, then I won't be involved. So uh, I guess, um, you know, that's, that's what I stand for is, uh, is, is getting behind something 100%, uh, working hard. And I guess on the cricket field, um, courage maybe is a word that's overrated sometimes. I think it's more about... Um, you know, always uh, staying in the contest, working hard, enjoying the battle, and that's something I did. Is that something that evolved over time, these qualities, or do you believe you always had them? I'm asking this in the context of leaders. Do you, have, do you believe leaders are born, or are they made over time? I think with, with all of us who have leadership qualities, um, sometimes they've got to be, uh, you know, poked and prodded a bit, and sometimes you need some encouragement or you need a mentor to bring those qualities out, but I think within all of us we have leadership qualities, um, it's just sometimes they don't get the opportunity to show that they can become a leader. I think you need someone really positive as a role model. You know, in a sense, uh, uh, Rajan, the kind of, uh, you don't come, uh, Rajan Mittal, from a sort of traditional business background. Your father was a politician and yet you and your brother built this large corporate empire. The question that I asked you, you know, are leaders in a sense made or are they born? Is this something you believe over time you all evolved into a situation where you've become business leaders? You know, Rajdeep, I think leaders, while they are born, but they evolve. And certain time when you are not in that field, particularly a family like ours, when we started, we came from a very different background. So us, for us, the evolution has taken place. And in our, you know, uh, life, we have seen as an entrepreneurs, you have to be risk takers. That something does come along if you came from a political family. The risk-taking ability does come, as you're fully aware. Now, entrepreneurs have to be courageous. And entrepreneurs have to be risk-takers. Entrepreneurs also have to be seeing the landscape much ahead of times. So it is evolution as we go along in our lives to see what's good, what's not good for the business, how do we set the environment around us? How do we set the agenda around us? The reason I ask you this is because in India, you've had traditional family businesses. Even politics, in a sense, is a family business for many. Do you believe that it's, it's possible to, for, for, for leaders today to evolve who do not have that family background or that asset of having a family business that they simply come and take over one day? No, I think, as I said, India has actually gone through a sea change. If we saw in earlier years, you're right, there were, you know, a few families who were in, you know, business families were there and that's how it went. The new kids on the block came in, new entrepreneurs came in. We have been part of one of the liberalization of this country's wave that we have come in. And as we, I see around, uh, you know, the years, new generation entrepreneurs are coming in. So that evolution is taking place. The good part, I would say, we are not no more, a, you know, a, which you could call a business which is run by family. That norm and term we have changed. We are a business family. It's not a family business anymore. You know, the, the good thing, of course, is in cricket, uh, you know, it's not a family business. It's purely on merit. Uh, you know, you don't have to rely, you know, just because uh, my father played for India, uh, but that didn't make me a cricketer. Uh, do you get a sense in that sense that cricketers or sportsmen are truly self-made? And that's where a lot of their leadership skills are built because they, they do it on their own merit. That gives them a greater sense of self-confidence. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I was a little bit different because I was a twin and Mark played a lot of test cricket and one day it's for Australia as well. So it was almost like a family playing for Australia. But um, yeah, you've got to become... Uh, cricket's an unusual game because it's a team game, but it's also individual. 
you've got to work really hard as an individual to improve yourself in your game, but then you've got to fit and mould into a, into a team environment. So it teaches you a lot of good life skills which are very handy for business afterwards and in my philanthropic world, you know, how to build a team which is really important. Um, but you, you do become self-reliant and you've got to work it out for yourself, um, but at the same time you've got to fit into the goals of the, of the organisation or the cricket team. So It's a bit of both, but let me ask you this, because you know, you were also the leader of a, a, of a remarkable Australian team, you know, which swept everything before it. You all won 16 test matches in a row, you won a World Cup, uh, and it was, you know, it was the top team of the world. Was that easier, in a sense, to lead? than it would have been had you not had the kind of great cricketers around you. Do you, believe, do you believe leadership is only as good as your team is? Of course, if you've got good players, you can play a certain style of cricket, and that was very aggressive. I mean, it would be no use for me telling the players to go out and score 300 runs in a day in test cricket if they didn't have the skill or the talent. So you've got to be realistic with the people around you. But uh, when you've got a good side, um, obviously that's the easy part. The difficult side is, I guess, managing the players within your side. They uh, you have strong personalities some with uh, strong egos, um, everyone is different, they all want to do well. So that's the hard part of ha about having a good side is managing the, uh, I guess, the aspirations and, uh, and personalities within that group. I'm just wondering whether Michael Clark will be seen as not such a good leader because they're losing or is it simply because he just d doesn't have the kind of personnel that you were very fortunate to have? Yeah, look, there's, there's a bit of both in there. Um, you look, I think cricket, uh, rightly or wrongly, statistically you're judged on, on what you do, your, your stats. Um, sometimes that can be unfair, but I think Michael Clark right now, people say he's a very good uh, tactician on the field. Uh, maybe some would say the, the jury's out on is he a good leader of people? And that's, there's, there's two different, there's different skills you've got to learn as a leader. Tactically is one part, leading men, um, you know, doing the right thing off the field, dealing with media, dealing with administration, dealing with sponsors. Um, there's uh, family pressures, there's a lot of things that go into being a captain, it's not just on the field. But I think Michael Clark is going to be a very good captain. You know, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, leadership is tested most believe in adversity. Today, there's a general feeling that there's far more competition, the economy is slowing down. Does that make leadership more difficult? Or in a sense, as I said, adver adversity should bring out the best in a leader. How do you, how do you deal with leadership in a slowdown? When there are tough times, leaders have to lead their followers or their colleagues or their co-partners, as I call it, in a different way. You need to set the agenda. You need to lead by example. You need to mentor your people because there are the same people around that time and they start behaving very differently. It is the behavioral change of the leader that will determine how well you have done when their things are going tough. You've had to deal, let's say, with a more difficult uh, a relationship uh, or, or a difficult process when it has come to the retail sector. The Bharti-Walmart partnership has been much more difficult, let's say, than your, than your entry into telecom. How do you then deal with that? How have you dealt with it differently? <clears throat> you know, I have to say, while telecom now has, over a period of time, kind of, you know, has gone through many ups and downs, it's stabilized, so, you know, people don't talk about it. And as the retail piece being, you know, become a central focal point, especially with Walmart being a partner, it brings different kind of, you know, news around us. It has been challenging, it has been tough, but we've been able to talk to the stakeholders, talk to people, be it government, be it political leaders, be it people in the retail industry. We've been able to give a roadmap, we've been able to define that going forward in 10 years time, it's not just for us. It is for the nation that you will see as it happened in telecom. I had the same adversity in telecom and it was being, you know, broken in for the first time. Everybody said, what's going to happen to national security? How things are going to pan out? Look at the change that has happened. My belief is you got to talk to people. You got to be logical. You got to be trustworthy and you must have the integrity. If you believe as a leader, you don't have an integrity to sell something. It's not good for you to go stand for a short time. You know, it's important. It's, it's, a, it's an important word, which is trust. How do you build trust in your team over time? You know, eventually to the point where your team is ready to take, go with you to any battle. And, and adversity is a battle. Uh, you found, for example, in India. Coming to India was, was a huge battle for the Australian team. And, uh, you know, it was the final frontier, in a sense, uh, for you. Uh, sadly, you were not able to conquer it. But Taking your men into, into a tough situation like coming to play in India and trying to defeat India in India, what did it take uh, for you as a leader? 
I think good attitude is the key. I mean, you've got to have a really positive attitude. And that's, uh, we came to India, as you say, in the 2001 series. Um, we wanted to play good, aggressive, positive cricket. I think it was one of the great series of all time. Unfortunately, we lost, as you, as you mentioned. But I still believe that was one of the best series of test cricket I played in. But I think as a leader, you get trust by, uh, by your actions, not so much your words. I think people, they watch and see your body language. They see how you interact with other people, um, how you train as a player, what you do on the field, what positions you put yourself in. Um, um, so that you, you can't ask someone in your side something you're not willing to do yourself. You know, because you had a difficult relationship, for example, with Shane Warne. In a cricket team of 11 people, you will have 11 people of presumably different personalities. How does a leader stamp his own personality then on a team? Yeah, look, I, I didn't have a problem with Shane at all while we are playing. It, uh, it wasn't a problem. I think it's been after we finished playing that um, I think certain things happen. Obviously, I had to drop Shane as a player and that um, perhaps later on that um, had a bit of an influence on things. But um, look, yeah, you're not always going to get along with every player in a team, but I think it's about, you know, as a leader, you don't, you don't have to be liked. It's nice to be liked, but the number one thing is to be respected. You know, uh, uh, there's another factor that the two of you have in common, because both of you, in a way, are, uh, if I may call it, uh, a brother act. You know, you and your brother, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, Rajan Mittal, have been identified, uh, in a sense, with the, with the Bharati success story. Does that breed competition, in a sense, or has it been two is always better than one? What's the philosophy for leadership? Has there always to be one person who leads uh, in, a, in, a, in a corporate enterprise like Bharti or is it a double act in a sense? You know, I think it can be absolutely complementary. So there's no question of competition because you're not competing against each other. You're competing for making an organization, building an institution for the outside world. And given that it is always one plus one as they used to say in earlier times, one plus one can be 11. And if you play a negative side, one minus one is going to be zero. So if it's your mindset is that you are building an institution for a larger uh, you know, plan and for a larger picture, I think it's very complimentary. It works extremely well. Did that happen in the cricket field? Was that healthy competition, Steve versus Mark Waugh? Because ironically, you had very different personalities. I mean, you know, it's almost the all were twins who were complete, who were determined to be as different from each other. Oh, look, I think on the cricket field, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect your personality or character. It's the way you play the sport. Um, perhaps away from the game, we might be a lot more similar. But um, yeah, look, it was interesting playing with Mark. I mean, we played for a lot of time and people growing up, I think there was more competition because as twins, we always stood out. We had talent at both at any sport we played and there was always who's a better cricket player, who's a better soccer player, who's a better tennis player, who's getting the better marks at school. So we were constantly being compared. But then we got, when we got to Australia, it was almost like, let's go our separate ways and let's be our own personalities and our own people because growing up as twins, we're always seen as being together. I'm going to take a break at this point because I'm going to raise an important point after that, leadership and philanthropy. Because both the Bharti Foundation and what Steve Waugh is doing are critical to look at leadership beyond the boundary. That's after a short break. You're watching Leader Talk. Welcome back. You're watching Leader Talk and we have two very special leaders with us, Rajan Bharti Mittal of Bharti Enterprises and Steve Waugh, former Australian test player. Let me come to this issue of corporate philanthropy uh, or philanthropy in general. A lot is spoken about it. Let me start with you, Steve, again, because, you know, you've done remarkable work. Many Indians today admire you not just for what you did on the cricket field, but what you've done off it to have spent so much time among the poor and the sick in Kolkata with your Udayan home. What inspired you? What drove you to really take a leadership position, in a sense, uh, in a field completely so far apart from cricket? It's a good question, I, and I don't really know sometimes. I think fate leads you in certain directions, but I guess the catalyst for me was meeting Mother Teresa. I'd always wanted to meet her. I thought she was just this amazing person. And I was lucky enough on one tour in, to, to India to uh, actually meet her one morning. And it just got me thinking, you know, I position my, uh, I guess, um, I guess in my position of authority and being being for the Australian side, um, I, I guess I, I thought I could could help people, and uh, I started raising money, and then I realised I could um, bring awareness to causes, and then I joined up with Udayan, and uh, one thing led to another. That's been going 14 or 15 years now. I started my own charity in Australia eight years ago called the Steve Waugh Foundation, uh, but really it was meeting Mother Teresa, and that was a catalyst for me getting into my charity work. But it was just knowing that I could use my profile for a good cause. You know, uh, uh, so much is spoken about corporate social responsibility, uh, Rajan Mittal, and there's a feeling that Indian corporates don't do enough. Uh, 
you've started the Bharti uh, Foundation and you work among schools in particular in rural areas. Do you believe that that is critical today to wealth creation? That any wealth creator, put, creator particularly in a country like India, must in a sense have that philanthropic mindset to give back to society? You know, Rajdeep, I think it actually started a lot in our earlier days. If you see the old business houses, they used to invest a lot in this. And then for, I would say, 30, 35 years, nothing happened. As the but the older generation did much did more for much. temples and yeah, exactly. charities. That's they what didn't I said. do enough for schools and rural areas in the manner that they, they, now companies yeah. are doing. Because I think they felt at that time that it is state's job to create all of this. The education, the health care, and rightly so. That is what the state's job is. But over a period of time, that's not happened. The gap is widening today. We can clearly see that. And as we come from a different background, different family background, we do understand that this country requires each one of us who is creating wealth through the resources which has been given an opportunity to people like us to give back to the society. And there are many things that one can do. We have picked up education because we believe there is a fundamental need for this country. When you can educate your people, everything will follow. So every corporate should take up one issue ideally. I, I, I would say because there are so many issues for us to handle. Otherwise, it just gets you know thinned down. You know, I, I take the point, but you know, sports persons, You've set up, as you said, the Steve Waugh Foundation. I, I see that in international sports uh, sportsmen a lot. Setting up foundations that work for charity and philanthropy doesn't happen enough in India. Do you believe that more Indian sports persons also should be taking up one big cause? Because you have the brand appeal uh, to, to reach out to millions of people. Look, at the end of the day, you've got to be committed. You've got to want to do it. You, you can't force people into something they don't really want to do, or they're not passion, passionate about it. And maybe it's not for everyone. I think you can give to charity in different ways. You can give, you can give time, you can give money, or you can give knowledge. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can give to a charity. I've been putting 20, 30, 40 hours a week into my charity since I've retired. And, and you've got to do that to make sure it, it stands for itself and it actually it actually has the outcomes that you want, want it to have. Um, so running a foundation is, is, some, is serious business and you've got to do it properly. How do you define, uh, in a sense, success today as a leader, uh, uh, Rajan Mittal? Is it from bottom line? If uh, Bharti's stocks go up, if, if your bottom line every year goes up, is that how you now define it after so many years in business? Or will it be defined by the fact that Bharti is associated with a particular brand value? Would you li ideally like it to be associated with a particular brand value? Much in the manner, let's say, that the Tatas are, more than 100 years after Jamshedji Tata set up the Tata Group. We as leaders who are trying to lead uh, something is very clear in our mind, at least, what Bharti stands for. We want to do s businesses where we can transform the Indian society. Be it telecom, be it retail, insurance, foundation, wherever we touch, there is a transformation. We believe in that and that's a long term. But profitability surely must matter also. Well, b look, that's, a, that's important because that's a part of sustainability of all that you're going to do. If you're going to do that, you're going to be having thousands of people working for your brand. You can't do it if you are not successful. So that success, passion has to drive. But the end goal cannot be that. So end goal as a leader is for people to stand out and say, this is a company that I need to be associated with. This is the company that I need to be part of it. This is the brand I like to own. So that is kind of a you know evolution for us that eventually must drive us to do things. That's interesting. You know, I, I in Steve, I want to conclude with you. You've written a book, I believe, and you've got it there. It's a, it, it's about luck, I believe. Uh, it's it's about the role of luck in a sense linked to leadership. Yeah. Uh, how important is luck in this entire? Yeah. It's called Steve. Well, that's your. There it is. Yeah, just in case. Yeah, uh, look, it's called the meaning of luck. Um, look, it's it started out a book that. Um, was based on my wife who had a stroke eight years ago and she should have passed away, she was in intensive care, miraculous recovery, she had to learn the basics of everything to back to where she is now and basically she's leading the foundation. So, um, And she calls her stroke a stroke of luck because it gave her a different perspective on life and she saw things differently after it happened. So that got me thinking about is luck involved in what we do and I've, it's a collection of stories in sport, business, charity, the amazing people I've met like Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa and explores the meaning of luck. But to me, I guess, there are some moments in your life where there is an element of luck, but at the end of the day, it's basically what you make of the opportunities in front of you, uh, whether, you see, whether you see those opportunities, whether you're open to those opportunities, and your attitude that you take from it. Luck has had a big role to play in, in, in corporate success? You know, or you make your own luck? No, you're always at a time when luck does favor you, but there's no substitute to hard work. If you can't convert that, 
by your hard work shit in that all luck will come and go i'm going to tell uh, steve in conclusion you know you, you never won that big test series in india but i i want to say this to you that the work that you've done particularly in kolkata with the udayan home i think you've conquered indian hearts which i think is far more important than winning a test series yes. yeah look it's it's uh, look uh, i love coming to india i think it's a fantastic country with great people uh, you're right i would have loved to have won that but we won the world cup back in in 87 so that's right you know we had some success here so uh, and you can't always win but i think it's about the attitude and and the way you play the game that that's really important as well well both of you are winners gentlemen pleasure having you steve war rajan bharti mittal on leader talk that was leader talk another episode where we've shared mantras of successful leadership we'll be back next week with another episode thanks for watching goodbye